have a, 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 an exciting message for me to share with you tonight because I love it when God gives me things different ways. And uh, as uh, I was this weekend, I was ministering in Manchester, so I said, God, you know, I'm not going to be home to prepare, so you're going to have to just give me a download of what it is that you want me to share that's going to be uh, 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 meet the uh, needs and, and touch the people that are there. And that, that whole day... I kept hearing in the spirit realm, I'm not saying the Lord said, but I, I kept hearing in the spirit, spirit realm, hmm, hmm. And being a mother of three, it sounded like when I would feed my little child. And, you know, you could try to get them open your up through your mouth and you'd go, hmm, you know, and you'd put that, 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 that spoon in their mouth. And, you know, then I had one kid, it, they didn't do the hmm, they did the num, 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 num. You know, they, they, I had one that, that one that did that, but you would you would just feed them. But I kept hearing that in the spirit, and I and so finally I asked the Lord. I said, "What does that mean?" You know, evidently something's going on that tastes good. You know, that was that was uh, my thought there, and I I believe that's a small portion of what I want to say tonight. In Psalms thirty four eight, it says, "Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good." I believe that we are coming to a place of so experiencing the Spirit of God that uh, we don't have anything to compare to it before. I mean, the only thing we can look at is His, Him to, and His goodness. And then in Psalms 23, 5 is another scripture I felt led to, and, it's, and we're talking about how Jesus prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And, you know, a table is a place that you eat. But I heard the Spirit of God say this, he is going to bring forth a fearless people that can sit down and eat and, the, and not be thwarted by their enemy. Resist the enemy and he will flee and you can sit at the table in that favorable position that God has given you. So before we go on, can you just lift your hands? Father, I pray for each one of these. Father, we know the season we're going into, each gets better. Father, we, we acknowledge that. But this is not a season where we hold on and press through. Last year, this year, 2019 was a little bit like that. But 2020, as we go into this season, however it lasts, it is so experiential. Father, that it's like you're dropping uh, spiritual opportunities to connect with you. Father, that just keeps wooing us forward. And so, God, we say, would you touch our hunger right now? Because we have all the food and all the spiritual things before us. But, Father, if we don't have a hunger that we want to sit down and eat and, and a thirst that we want to drink, then we won't have our full, and we want to. And so we ask for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. But I still heard that, hmm, and so I finally wrote it down, and this is how I wrote it. I wrote M-M-M dot, 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 because how do you spell hmm, you know? I don't know. Oh, he's got it up there. Thank you. So it tastes good. And so I thought that was it. But as soon as I thought that was it, the Lord began to give me 20 Kairos M words for 2020. It, and it, it took moments. So um, I'm going to share them with you uh, uh, tonight. And the first one is move. Oh, I love this. Thank you guys back there. This is a move. The Spirit of God wants us to be able to see there is a lot of things that God has planted. There are seeds in this ground. There is already some levels of harvest. There's some levels of revival. There's some levels of awakening. And it is running together. And God is calling it a move. So whatever you want to call it, you can call it that. But I believe the Spirit of God is working in those directions. But it changes how we respond. Because before we would go, oh, God, please bring it forth. Give us a revival. Bring awakening. God, we've waited so long. God, uh, refresh us again. We're dry. We're thirsty. Take us to the waters. Let us drink of you. And now God's saying, manage and steward the revival and the awakening. Because revive is for you and me. See, unsaved people have never been vived, so they can't be revived. So revived is for you and me. We come forth in a life. And so the place that you always begin to steward is yourself. And then you begin to steward the next area around about you, the next sphere around about you that the Spirit of God gives to you. And um, I had this thought. Uh, have you ever had a dream where um, 
your legs just felt so heavy and you wanted to run, but, but you couldn't hardly move. And, and, you know, you just barely could move. Or worse yet, your feet were frozen and, and you wanted to run and, and you couldn't go. Anybody ever have a, have a dream like that or maybe a nightmare like that? Well, the good news is this. That is not the season we're moving into. It is not like that. This is a move. Move means move. <laughs> and so we're moving. The cloud is moving. The pillar of fire is moving. The river is moving. The, we have been at a mountain too long. And now winds of change are blowing around about us. And the Spirit of God is declaring that this is a move. And you act differently and you participate with the Spirit of God differently, and we align differently in the midst of it. And I believe one of the reasons that the Lord gave me this in simple word forms is so that we can remember it, and, and we can walk into it and continue to partner with it as we go into next year. Now, the second word, M word, Kairos word that the Lord gave me is mandate. And the Lord says that in this season, we're going to have a mandate to run. I like that. I like that. You know, I have some really an anointed friends that are so good, but the, that, that just minister so well and so anointed. But, you know, everybody has styles they like best. Have you ever been around people that talk so slow you just want to get behind them and push them? <sighs> I, 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 or, or just you feel like they've, they've unwound and you just want to kind of wind them back up, you know, because you think, dear Lord, are we ever going to get to the end of your sentence? Uh, they're like that. Uh, this is not a season that we get to do it at our own pace. There is a mandate to run at this time. Now, I know that some of you will be thinking, oh, but, you know, we don't want to be weary. We want to be balanced. We want to uh, uh, have everything in order in our lives. Listen, there are times when the order is extreme. There is time when the order is be outrageous. There is time to have thing in order where it means limitations have just been removed off of you. Uh, confinement has just been released and you have been and the conditions are right and it's time to run and you get to gain ground that you wouldn't have got to gain at any other time. Because when you're doing something in alignment at the right season, there is a grace. I call it a vehicle of grace that can get you where you need a whole lot faster than you thought was uh, possible. And so uh, I'm going to ask Greg to put on uh, this video. This video is about a Kenyan athlete called Elug Kipchob. I know I said his name wrong. He can and see I the watched this line. marathon on October 12th on a Saturday. And this marathon was taking place in uh, Vienna. And it's the guy in the white that is the runner. And uh, they set up this course in Vienna to break the, uh, the marathon in under two hours that has never been done before. And so he's the first man to run a marathon under two hours. Now you he can see the finish line. That's the view from Elliot Kipchoge. You can see the finish line where we are looming into view. 157 and approaching 158. I think we can say with some certainty there now he he's, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's right going. He's Go on. to move away. Come on, he says. Come on, this is it. Shalena, final this thought from you. This is incredible. Elliot's performance is such a gift to the world. His running is a gift to all of us. I feel so blessed to be here today. I feel like, I hope everyone can hear me smiling through this microphone right now. I cannot stop smiling. 500 meters to go. He has the Hauptalli to himself. He's All the pacemakers have let him go. As Ed said, he is sprinting into the history books here. They're cheering him on. 400 meters to go. Let's bring him home. This is history unfolding on the streets of Vienna this morning. It's a Saturday run like we've never seen before. Listen at the noise, the crowd getting right behind him. Goodness me, 300 metres to go. He can see the finish line here. Neil Armstrong we had on the moon in 1969. We had Roger Bannister, the four-minute mile 65 years ago. Edmund Hillary, the first man to climb Everest in 1953. We have one minute to go. Elliot Kipchoge is on his way here. It's this, humble, be a this humble farmer who used to run two miles to school every day and back, he used to go to the nearest town on his bike 
to sell milk at the local market. And now, through hard work and discipline, he's pointing. Come on, he says. Elia Kipchoge has the hand of history on his shoulder. He has less than 200 metres to go. Elliot Kipchoge, let's keep an eye on the clock, into the final 20 seconds. Elliot Kipchoge got his shoulder, 140, oh, oh, oh. 140, the unofficial oh, line. there's his wife. Elliot, Elliot Kipchoge storms into the history books in Vienna. 159.40, the unofficial time. The first man to run a marathon in under two hours. One final lung-busting stride for Kipchoge. One giant leap for human endeavour. And you know, Kipchoge was right. No human is limited. Woo! The reason I showed that is, I believe, as God says, we have a mandate to run. This is a record-breaking time for the church that we are moving into. Now, that's not part of my message, but could you see how the formation of his pace uh, uh, setters around about him? He had those kind of in an arrow position in the front and two flanking uh, his rear, you know, uh, uh, working with the, with the airflow to, to help the conditions for him uh, to run just right. The reason he chose to do that in Vienna was because of how, uh, I think it, they said it was 540 feet above sea level, which is a perfect condition uh, to be able to run in. And as I was watching it that day, I was crying because that, that was the first race his wife has ever even saw him run. Is that incredible? But also, do you realize all of those pacemakers have trained with him? All of those are runners in their own right. All of those are successful. And there was about 20 of them that kept changing off and on at different paces. And did you know in the record books, only one man's name is going down? And yet they had to keep him on target the whole race so that he could actually uh, accomplish that feat. Now, that's not my message, but isn't that phenomenal? So I believe that Jesus is our pace setter in this season, but it is going to take us helping each other stay on that mark. And this is going to be a record-breaking time in the church, and uh, we're going to do things that we have never done before and break barriers that we didn't even know needed to be uh, broke before. And when I was listening to this, if you listen farther uh, earlier, the commentator said, I never believed that I would live to see this. I believe that is going to be said about the church. I never thought I was going to live to see this. Uh, I thought I wouldn't see it in my lifetime. And, you know, it is as significant as that was, and he has now broke uh, the two-hour uh, uh, marathon time. Uh, they mentioned Roger Bannister. Uh, Roger Bannister did the four-minute mile. But as soon as he did the four-minute mile, 46 days later, someone broke his record. And immediately following after that, so many people broke their record, they don't even count that. What happens is if we are in a record-breaking time in the church, we are breaking through for so many to move into a new place that they have never been before. It isn't just about you. It is about, uh, it is about the God raising the church and bringing them to a new place. And I, uh, uh, I want to read you this. This was a quote by uh, 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 a marathon winner. But let me say this about, about breaking a barrier that works for everybody else. Once people stop believing it's impossible, it's possible. I think that's what's happening during this time. Now let me read this quote. Uh, this is by a marathon winner. He says, the later stages of a marathon are an ugly fight between your mind and your body. Your mind will keep telling the body to run while the body will start to give up. Uh, they will keep fighting until neither have the energy to fight any longer. This is when your heart must step in and convince both your mind and your body to keep going. That's exactly why marathon runners have strong bodies, stronger minds, and the strongest of hearts. Don't you like that? I, I love that one. But one of the things that God impressed on me uh, uh, as I was trying to look up some of the statistics was this. We're going to have to be a people that forget how hard it was, forget the miles, and remember the glory. We are going to have to be a people that during this time, if we have a mandate to run, 
run like your life depends on it. Isn't that incredible? So lift your hands. Father, we impart that. Father, the joy. Everybody here d think, does not look at running as a joy. So you're going to have to turn it around in our heads. You're going to have to turn it around, Father, in the way that we see it. But, Father, that this is a time when we are able to let, let loose of the anchors and the sandbags and all of the things that have weighted us down. We're able to strip back and just go forward as fast as we can possibly go. And we declare that we have never lived in a time like this and we don't even know what this looks like. And we say, but God, we thank you. You are our pace setter and you are running right there with us. And I heard the Spirit of God say this. He says, I'm not just a pace setter, says the Lord, to help your feet get where they need to be. I am a pace maker to help your heart get where it needs to be, says the Lord. For the Lord says, just like I will align your feet to get to a finish line, I will align your heart to get there also, says God. Amen. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap. My next mm, a Kairos M word is momentum. And I don't know if you remember about a month ago, we came in here and I was going to get up and pray over you as we started church. And I opened my mouth just to welcome you. And out of my mouth came words I did not plan. And if, if you think that's odd, then uh, hang around prophets. That's not odd. It does happen every once in a while. You open your mouth. And I said, instead of saying, welcome, it's good to have you here. I said, I want you to know you have just entered a no spectator zone. And I thought, well, that sounded friendly, didn't it? You know, you know, as I said that, but you know what it was is what God is saying is about the momentum. He's calling all of us into a new level of actively participating together with him. Now, my husband uh, ran track and different field events, and uh, he would talk about how they would run, but but. Right at the end, and we have Aisha here that runs for, for Great Britain, that, you know, you see when you're watching a race how all of a sudden you think they'd be exhausted. Where do they get that last kick? Have you ever wondered, where, where do you get that sudden power surge that causes you to be able to do what was impossible when you should be depleted at that moment? I don't even know that, except that we have to be able to get that from God. But I believe it's God's going to have it there at this time because we're breaking personal records. We're breaking uh, church records. And what I don't, I'm not talking about membership, and I'm not talking about size of buildings. I'm talking about impact into the world and influence and change. And I believe that we're going to accomplish great feats uh, for Christ with the momentum uh, that, that we have. So again, this is an impartation time, so lift your hands. You won't get sleepy. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask for your momentum for myself and every one of them here. Father, there's nothing worse than feeling like we're going slow when you called us to move fast. Father, there are people in here who have wrongly been taught that they were outrunning God. And God, we declare over them today, there is no way they can go faster than you. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we break off, Father, every limitation that says to be wise means I go slow and steady. But, Father, when it's a time to run, we say, God, loose them. Father, let them hear that gun blast, that pistol blast. Let them hear, Father, the release to pour their energy into this momentum in the name of Jesus. Amen. The next uh, Kairos word the Lord gave me is moment. And the Lord is saying that this is your moment. This is an incredible defining time in your life. This is when you get to find out what's really on the inside of you. See, God already knows what's on the inside of you. He made you. He, he put the ingredients there in your mother's womb. But this is the time you get to find out what's on the inside of you. When you have that type of endurance and you're called to run uh, uh, like that, uh, this is your moment and, and when you have that moment, you don't think, oh, I'll, I'll do it next week. This is one of those times that we prepare ourselves uh, uh, for it. And I believe it means what we can do what we couldn't do uh, before. And again, I'm going to use the words I used a moment ago, outrageous and extreme. Is there anybody in this room that you do outrageous and extreme better than you do moderation? Hallelujah. Amen. My husband and I do better outrageous and extreme. How many in the room 
Dieting is hard, but fasting and being extreme is actually easier. Some people it is. I mean, Greg and I, we can fast easier than we can diet. You know, I mean, some people just do extremes better uh, 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 than, than that. But Bible does say, let your moderation be known to all men. So we know that there's a place for that. But here, when we're talking about this is your moment, there is a you that God is saying, come out of the box. There is an outrageous you, and there is an extreme involvement that you are being invited into. So lift your hands. Father, I pray for these right now. And Father, we declare that when we are in your timing and we're in the right alignment, the grace is there. Father, that you are releasing things that we're going to discover about ourselves in this in this timing and father that there will be those father that will find out they have strengths that they did not know they have this is their moment father to shine and father we declare that they will the next m word that the lord gave me is measure and measure is usually an amount of distance meant to be reached in that season i believe we're entering into a season where we don't exactly know where the finishing line is uh, but we know that if we run for it, then uh, and the Holy Spirit will guide us, and Jesus will be our pace setter, that we will end up at the right place. But I believe the Lord also wants to instill in us, the words measure, a, a faith, a measure of faith, so that we will be able to deal with uh, uh, the, the enemy during this time so we don't get sidetracked into battles that we don't have to fight and shouldn't have to take long. You know, if it's a time of advancing and a time of running, that means that, you know, you're just going to have to deal with your enemy fast. Just lift your sword and as you run by, you know, just, just let him have it and keep running. Don't, d d you know, you don't need to get in a valley and go to war. It's not one of those kind of seasons. And I, I really like that. You know, uh, people think us prophets love battle. No, we love victory. It is, you know, they think, oh, you just like the war cry, and that's who you are. No, we battle because we love. You know, that's, that's what you do. But uh, this is one of those areas where God is giving us a measure of faith to overcome unexpected warfare and opposition. But also in the area of measurement, there's a new measurement being given. And um, I'm probably not going to title what I, what, I, what I eventually give the word of the Lord for, for the year. This isn't that. I'm probably going to title that, maybe, um, um, New is the New Normal. Last year, so many of us prophets were saying uh, new really means new. And we did move into a lot next year. But I think what we found out was that is our new normal. It's, it's not going to change. It is going to keep being new because when you're moving forward, you're not repeating. You're, you're advancing, and so there's always the freshness upon that. But I ask God, what were some new normals we're going to get? I believe the measurement of success is going to change for many of us. You know, in, uh, when I was younger, the measurement of success upon a church was the building and how many members they had. Some places are still that way. We are not that way. You know, um, that's, that's, that is not what mo motivates us. But uh, some people's measurement of success was how much finances came in or how many staff they were able to support or, um, or, or that. But I want you to know, I believe there's a measurement of success that is being released for you and for the church today that is one of those things that leaves a lasting impact. And whatever it takes to leave that lasting impact, it won't be the same for all of us. But I believe God wants to bring for that forth in you, a new measure of success. But I also believe he's bringing forth a new measurement of transformation. Because transformation in the last uh, 15 years meant that we would go to some area that was derelict in some way or that was run down or need, in need of, of a, a renewal. And we would pour, pour uh, finances and we would bring people to serve uh, those people to help build into those families and we would make a difference in a community and we would support different services so uh, that, that were carrying into the community and that the church would be a part of a region or a community or a city's transformation. All of those things are good, 
but something happened about five years ago. The message went through such a, a, a change where it almost became, what's the word when you just do humanitarian efforts? There we go. It became the, uh, a humanitarian efforts rather than no matter how much I do, without the power and without the glory of God, it is not a lasting impact. And you cannot divide the spirit of God from going in and doing a humanitarian effort. It has to be a combination there. And I believe God is giving us a new measurement of success in that area on a whole new scale that we have not seen. So just do this. I'm taking my new measurement. Taking my new measurement. My next uh, uh, Kairos word was muscle. And uh, this is a special word for me. Uh, I know you know that uh, God raised me up out of a wheelchair at 27. But one of the characteristics of the bone disease is my body resists building muscle, you know. And I would really like to have some guns. I just don't, you know. I mean, I try, but they're, 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 they're just not there. And so, you know, I mean, when you don't have a lot of muscle, you don't get to eat a lot either. I'd, I would like some more muscle so I could eat some more, you know. The, and, uh, does that sound selfish? But I, I would like that. So anyway, God raised me up, but my body still resists uh, building muscle a bit. And so I have had to really learn to depend on God in this area because nobody can walk on their skeletal, uh, uh, and mine's not, you know, mine is a miracle anyway that my, my body's put together. But so when the Lord gave me that word muscle, I already had the scripture in my heart that I have been living for years. And this is Ephesians 3.20 out of the Passion Translation. And it says, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. <sighs> we got some athletes here tonight. How many want to say, I'll take some more of that? That's supernatural energizing. Some people have to have it. Some people get to have it. All of us should have it. Is that right? And so when he say muscle, muscle is equivalent to strength. And so, you know, without strength, you can't, you can't accomplish all the things uh, that God's called you to, be, to do. Isn't it interesting that when Moses died, that God wanted Joshua to know that he needed to be strong. You need to be strong at this time. A change of season demands a new level of strength. Lift up your hands. Father, I release the revelation that you gave me over this scripture that the power of your spirit goes beyond physical ability. And just as Elijah outran the chariot, Father, there are things that are going to happen during this season, Father, that is going to cause our bodies to partner with the supernatural muscle, so, Father, so that we can accomplish for your kingdom's sake all that you desire. Amen. Now, my next M word, and you might think it's uh, me playing with it, but it, that was how the Lord gave it, more glorious. Okay, and we are going from glory to glory. Uh, glory, miracles, signs, wonders, I believe, are all going to be on display like you and I have never seen. And, you know, you can say this every year, but it's true every year because they keep increasing. We are seeing more than we have ever seen before. I was just in Manchester. I came back today doing a conference. It was a mighty conference. Emma Stark was there. Jane, Prophet Jane Hammond was there. Ken Gott was there, myself and a few others. It was, a, it was an incredible uh, 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 time. And, you know, I had been there at the earlier part of um, October. Is that right, Greg? Or end of, end of October, 1st of November? No the 1st of October, to train their prophetic teams so their prophetic teams would be ready for this conference. And so when I was there, we had an open night. And in that open night, there was a lot of healings. But, you know, then you leave and you don't hear. And so when I was back, I had six different people come to me that had instantaneous healings. And one had didn't even know the Lord and has since then got saved. The man had had a horrible accident, and, it, and, and his neck... And his shoulder did not move at all. 
and he even had had a plate in it that, that they had to take back out because the body was trying to reject it or something. And so he just could not move this side of the body and hadn't been able for years. And have you ever seen those people in congregations that you know they're really not the people you want to minister to? He was one of those. And, uh, you know, and I said, sir, God wants to heal your neck and shoulder. What's the matter with it? You know, and he didn't even talk to me, but his sister next to him, you know, yelled back at us as we spoke healing over him. And the guy is, uh, was a professional guitar player. He went home that night and played his guitar for three hours. And he has been able to function ever since. And uh, uh, he waited to receive salvation until I got there this week. Is that incredible? So I was very excited uh, about that. So I believe there's going to be different types of, of miracles and signs and wonders that are going to be on display. And the reason that it's happening is the atmosphere is actually changing. You know, thank God Brexit is not going to be forever. The divisiveness in the atmosphere is not going to be forever. Um, we are releasing glory, and, and the king of glory is coming through the gates, and, and that we are welcoming him, and we're releasing a hope for a sovereignty of this nation. And so the atmosphere is changing, and I believe Haggai 2.9 says that very clearly. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former, former house, says the Lord Almighty. I believe the atmosphere is going to another glory, and that's why we're seeing a more glory and a greater display of, of the works of God. But also, we need to really be careful at this time not to quench the Holy Spirit. And the way you quench the Holy Spirit is we get apathetic or we get uh, lethargic uh, spiritually. But when you're in a time like this, uh, when he's putting things on display and he says things are moving and there's a momentum and there's a mandate to, to run and I'm giving you muscle, do you realize that that would quench the Holy Spirit if we got into a spiritual lethargy or, uh, or, or got apathetic at that time? Because Jesus is getting ready to reveal himself in unprecedented ways, unrivaled ways that I don't believe the earth has ever seen before. Amen. Just lay hands on yourself. God, we say, God, you're not coming down to earth to do this without us. You're doing this in us and through us. So, Father, right now, we just thank you. That, and we just say, God, help, Holy Spirit, help us. We don't want to quench what you're doing. We want to partner with what you're doing. Amen. The next Kairos word the Lord gave me is majesty. And, you know, we just talked about glory, and I believe that we are going to arise, and we are going to shine uh, uh, with the greater glory of God, because we are his glorious church, and that uh, we see that it says that in Isaiah. But listen to this, greater glory always exposes lesser glory that we have built on. Do you hear that? It has to, otherwise there'd be no reason to have a greater glory. And so at this time, you're going to have to be careful not to get critical over a lesser glory that has been built on. Instead, be excited that we're going to a greater glory. Now, the word is majesty, not glory. So what has all that got to do uh, with majesty? Isaiah 6 says, the doorpost and the threshold shook. There is that shaking right now that's causing the lesser glory foundations and structures to fall. At this time, I'm not cursing the church. Don't anybody say that's what I'm doing. But the result of the shaking is going to be that you and I and nations are going to get to see the majesty of Jesus. And so this, what, what, this maneuvering and bringing forth the greater glory and showing the lesser glory, do you realize for many people it will be a very critical season? But when you know what is going on, you can celebrate it. You know, that, that lesser glory was all I had. Thank God I had it. Right? But I don't want it anymore. I want the greater glory that God is bringing forth. The next M word is manifestation. And uh, the Lord talked to me about, and he says, in this next season, it is going to be messy manifestation. All of you that love order and don't like mess, you know, um, just just ask for another level of grace. You know, my husband likes order. 
He really does. You wouldn't know it from seeing his desk, but he, but he really does like order. And a lot of times I'll preach him messages I'm studying because he thinks so methodical. He's, he's, he's like that. He really likes he really likes order. But also, you know, he likes order because he likes things black and white and everything should be where they, it should be. And things are either right or wrong. And he has a sense of justice about him. <laughs> uh, you think I'm changing the message? I'm not changing the message. But because he likes order so much, messiness is an irritation. For some of us, God says he's moving us into manifestation, and it is messy manifestation. I said, what does manif messy manifestation look like? And it looks like manifested devils and manifested miracles. They go together. In Mark 9, I think it starts at verse 25, it says, Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And the disciples said, why couldn't we cast that out? And Jesus said, this kind can come, can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Do you see that when Jesus uh, uh, operated in deliverance, when Jesus operated in that miracle, it was messy. It was messy. We would think, oh, no, 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 I've been taught to bind every manifestation, you know, so the enemy can't be seen. When I first was being trained to do RTF, and if you don't know what RTF is, it's called Restoring the Foundation. It's an inner healing, uh, a breaking of uh, sins passed down from generations, and it's uh, 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 delivering you from ungodly beliefs and setting godly foundations in your life. And um, uh, uh, where I worked at Christian International in Florida, they made all of us leaders go through it and get trained. And uh, that was not my desire, but I did it anyway. And, and it was good for me. But this one uh, anointed, anointed, anointed person, you know, we all had to go through it, and we all had to be trained in it. But this person is so anointed, so sweet, so precious, so dear. She just didn't want to go through this deliverance stuff at all. And so uh, anyway, so they were telling her one day, and they said, they said um, I'm not going to mention the name. They said, uh, I believe that God is speaking to us that you have a Jezebel spirit. And we know Jezebel spirits don't just target women, right? It doesn't mean that she was just an outspoken woman. We know that that's true. And, you know, they're very gentle. The, if you knew the people that wrote it, it's the Kilstras. You know, they're very gentle uh, people. Very Church of England. They do. They come across that way. Very, you know. So they're very gentle in that. And she goes, I just don't believe you. I don't believe I have that problem at all. And they said, well, then we take authority over that spirit of Jezebel. We say, come out. This little woman that weighed probably 100 pounds jumped up, ran out the door, and they had to tackle her in the front yard. What was happy? The devil was manifesting. But you know what? She saw it and said, get rid of it. <laughs> Do whatever it takes. Get rid of it. Some of us need to see what has been oppressing us so that we do not want to partner with it any longer. And that we say, hey, if we have to see some messy things to get to some areas of deliverance and manifested miracles, then we say, so let it be. Amen. Can you give the Lord a wave offering there? Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm excited by that. Um, but I believe for us prophetic people, when the Lord was speaking about manifestation, what we're doing is we're going from just revelation to revelation and manifestation. Because the Bible tells us that God confirms his word with signs following. See, it was, God never wanted to give a prophetic word as his opinion. He never wanted to give a prophetic word as a gossip or just as inside information. He said no, not one of his words are without power. And so this is a season, a manifestation, where you prophetic people, myself as, as well, we are going to see that the greater revelation is coming, but the greater manifestation is backing it up also at this time. Say with me, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Um, the other thing is, is when revelation is coming, I think so often people said God said it, so it's automatically coming to pass, and they do not understand that revelation releases a building assignment. And so all of us have to realize that if God's talking to you, 
He's commissioning you to do something. He's not just informing you. So, Father, I pray over all of these. Father, they have received so much direction from you at different times in their life. We ask you to recycle those assignments, Father, that they might be men and women of fulfilling 100% of their destiny and purpose upon their life. The next Kairos word that God gave me was magnitude. And in Habakkuk 1.5, it says, Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if I told you. Is that amazing? Isaiah 66, 8, can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? There is a magnitude to what the Spirit of God is doing now that it's going to affect us because some people, we would rather have something small so that, that, that we can work with it rather than something so big we don't know what to do. This is a big season. There is a great magnitude that is happening. I know churches that the pastors are praying for growth, but the people in the church like the small family atmosphere. And, and they're constantly working against that. You know, because they, they don't want that. This is our family. We're comfortable here. You know, we like it like this. Well, I want you to know that anything that's healthy grows. I don't think everything has to be a mega church, but anything that's healthy grows. And so here, God's saying magnitude. And so, God, we're asking you to bring us into understanding of that. Even knowing as we say that, you said you're doing more than we could think, dream, or ask. So we say help us. The uh, 11th... Uh, uh, Kairos word the Lord gave me is mass. I'm so grateful for you doing this, Greg. You make it easy for me. In John 14, 12, it says, Truly, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I am doing, and he will do even greater works than these because I go to the Father. I believe the greater is in number, not the greater as in how do you get greater than raising the dead and throwing a mountain into the sea? You know, I don't, I don't know about that. So it has. I believe it's in mass. It's in numbers that it's taking place. And I also believe we are moving into a season that I never really appreciated in the past, and I'm old enough to know this, but I believe we're moving into a stadium Christianity season again. And we are going to have some of the greatest uh, in 2020 evangelistic stadium events. And many of them are already, uh, the stadiums are already booked all over the world. And I've been invited to a few of them, and, I, and I'm so excited. But it, these are great harvest events that the Spirit of God is doing. This is part of the new normal that God is bringing forth. Next, our mindset. Uh, we're going from a local mindset to a global mindset. And, you know, when you talk about a mindset, that means it has got a position it holds. So how do you get rid of, we know the Word of God renews our mind, but how do you get rid of a position it holds? And the Spirit of the Lord says, I'm going to blow your mind, says the Lord. He says, to be able to change you from, from local to global, I'm going to blow your mind. So I can renew your mind, uh, uh, says the Lord. Give you a new uh, mindset so you won't just disciple communities, but you will, will start to influence nations. Uh, next Kairos word, uh, mixture. When, we were, when um, uh, Rob and I were at the... Um, a European prophetic summit. This was a strong agreed word among all the prophets that God is breaking off a mixture. Incorrect doctrines and ways that have infiltrated the body of Christ and brought compromise. These things are being broken off at this time. Some of that is just going to be plain old sin and a call to holiness uh, in our lives because there's a lot of things that we have changed our theology based upon what our culture is declaring today. And so, so in this area where God is dealing with mixture, there'll be a real call uh, to holiness. There'll be a real call to truth, a real call to righteous authority that God is bringing forth. And if you haven't recognized it, it's happening to all of us right now. Greg and I, we don't, we don't watch bad things on TV, but we can't even watch what we watched probably a year ago. It's already changed. Why? What was okay then isn't okay now. It's just not so, and I'm not talking about horrible things or nudity or, 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 or anything like that. Uh, he still does watch bodies being blown apart, you know, and uh, <laughs> superheroes flying everywhere. He hasn't got convicted about that at all. But the, uh, <laughs> the, 
But it's changing. And every one of us are seeing it change. We talk about we talk about what was allowed in the last season that's not being allowed now. You need to have conversations with someone so that you can kind of talk those things out because it's happening to all of us. There's things that was okay for my mouth to say in the last season that is not okay for my mouth to say in this season. And 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 so I have really had to pray, God, Holy Spirit, come put a guard on my mouth in that area. I don't want this mixture. Pure and bitter doesn't flow from the same spout you know and so there's just a new work of holiness to get rid of that mixture that we have got into so lift your hands father we just holy spirit we give you permission to come and set the plumb line aright in each one of our lives to bring us to a place where we reflect you in a greater way father that where jesus could sit with the sinners and they did not compromise him but he impacted them Father, we say that there is actually a work of your Holy Spirit going on in each one of us that is going to cause sinners to want to hang out with us and want to change because of having hung out with us. We thank you for that. Amen. I'm going to go quickly because I'm aware of the time. The 14th one is marginalized. And God is just saying, you're not going to be marginalized. There's some of you that has felt invisible. There's somebody of you that have felt like what you do hasn't counted for anything. And God says that you are not marginal to the church and you are not marginal to the move of God in the earth at this time. That he has need of you. So if there's inadequacies and there's rejections and there's old smallness and uh, 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 withdrawal and false humidity, there's really no better way to say it right now. Get healed and get over yourself. Yeah. There's a time you have to say that. You know, there's another time you put your arm around people and say, come on, let's go. You know, let me help your little heart get through this journey. But then there's a time when God uh, uh, causes that pistol to blast and we have to run. And what is more merciful, to say get up and come on or to leave them behind? I believe that's what's going on. You will not be marginalized. There's going to be unexpected opportunities for you to influence the kingdom of God in a great way. Fifteen, uh, means, M-E-A-N-S. That means the definition is basically resources, whatever you would have need of. That would be money, finances. That would be money power. That would be manpower. Uh, do you remember Lydia in, for Paul? I think that's Acts uh, 16. Uh, Lydia had the money. Lydia had the reputation, and Lydia had the opportunity to open up the door to her city, Thyatira, and to open it up so that Paul could come in and bring the gospel in that city. What is the means that you have need of to do the things that God's going to ask, that he is going to supply those uh, for you? The next Kairos word is missions. Uh, some people get the missions confused with projects. No. Missions is we disciple people, nations, advance the kingdom of God into all mountains and spheres. Keep it simple. That is the mission that we are called to do. And the 17th one is mouth. And if you uh, track with uh, Chuck Pierce, you know, he always gives us the Hebrew word for this year. It's pay, P E H which, uh, uh, you know, every Hebrew word is symbolic as well, and it means mouth. And so this is the season of the mouth. And this is a scripture that the Lord gave me in Exodus 4, 11 and 12. This is where God had raised up Moses to be a deliverer of his people, Israel, out of Egypt. And it says, Moses resisted God, saying that he could not speak. And God's answer to him is, who has made your mouth? Then he tells me, I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what to say. Lay hands on your mouth. Father, you are putting us into places where, where we can't speak with knowledge and experience because it's new. So, God, we say, uh, uh, do what you said that you would do for Moses. You made our mouth. Now teach our mouth afresh what to say. Jeremiah 1.10, behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. The mouth and your words and territorial authority are all linked together. 
and this scripture. My mouth is going to affect the territorial authority that I get to operate in. Your mouth is going to get to affect the territorial authority you get to operate in. And so everybody says, oh, God, help my mouth. Oh, God, help my mouth. Help that big ship. You know, help my mouth, God. Okay, the 18. The Kairos word is message. Again, I'm going to keep it very simple. What is the message? See, some people think, oh, my message is uh, education needs to be righteous for our children. Or my message is um, government needs to uh, uh, have moral laws. Or my message is uh, you need to love people into wholeness. No, our message is solutions. Solutions provide all the rest of that. The reason that people listen to you is you have a solution. That's what it is. You have a solution to the education. You have a solution to that problem. You have a solution to that business. Lift your hands. Father, right now, we ask for the prophetic on the inside of all of us, Father, to grow to another level. Father, where it is not just edification, exhortation, and comfort solely, but, God, that it would become sharp with those areas of solutions. Father, that the message might be released, that your favor might be released in the earth in a great way. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the 19th one is multiply. And, you know, the first time we heard that word multiply is in Genesis when God is speaking to Adam and Eve, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. But, you know, we also hear that same thing again when Jabez prays. And these were two of the four things he prayed for. He prayed that God would bless him and God would enlarge his territory. That means be fruitful and multiply, that he would bless him and enlarge his territory. And, you know, that is more than just a desire for real estate. You know, that's not what he was asking. It's more than just a, a desire for greater influence. It's more than just a desire for greater uh, responsibility. This is an invitation to, to be fruitful and multiply, to be blessed and to be enlarged. This is an invitation to be generational and to build legacy and leave a mark in the earth because you were created that you cannot be here and, and be birthed and, and live and die without bringing change. There is no way with the God on the inside of you that you can do that. And so this is your moment. Multiply. Um, also, so um, a, a word the Lord gave me was about the viral virtual church. And if you don't know what that means, like I always say, go ask somebody that's under 30. But a, a, a virtual Anything is usually where you where you see something and you're not there, but you see it in its 360 dimension. And viral is uh, uh, something that that is more in the area of what the internet, social media, something that has the attention of many. I think that it's going to get a lot of criticism this next season, but I think with such the million soul harvest that has already begun that it is not going to be about, do I have time to find another building? Do I have time to build a building? Do we use our finances in that direction? There is going to be a church planting movement that is virtual and viral in the earth as well. Not taking the place of the church at all, but we've got to be careful because there'll be those that go, that's not the real church. We're moving into the new. The last one, motivation, and maybe my favorite one. Um, this is where we get to finish what we start. I don't know about you. I don't like loose ends. They make me feel, you know, they make me feel in between. They make me feel unfinished. This is a time that, that we get to finish some things that we started because we're being loosed into the new. Just say, thank God. Thank God. I agree with you. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul encourages the Corinthians by saying, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What are they motivated by? They get to see their victories finally. They get to see their prayers answered. They get to see their breakthroughs. They get to see the harvest and not just believe for the harvest. They get to participate in the revival, not just pray uh, for the revival at this time. So we need to be real careful that we don't pull back 
and that we don't retreat at this time. Um, as a matter of fact, Hebrews 10, 39 says, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and we preserve our souls. So this is a time of culmination of promises. Look at your neighbor and say, giving up is not an option. You might have to encourage one another like a pace setter during this time. Giving up is not an option. I know I shared this with you uh, in September, the dream I had, but I believe it's a true motivation that we're going to all live in, and it's changing my life. This was a dream I had, I think it was either the end of August, 1st of September, and I, was tr I think I was trying to find my way through this, uh, uh, this nation in Europe. I thought it was maybe... Germany. But anyway, I was very disorientated. I was going down back alleys and trying to find my way back to my hotel. I had to hurry up, get to the hotel, get my luggage, get in a taxi and get to the airport or I was going to miss my flight to the next um, place. Now, for those of you that don't have those dreams, I have those dreams a lot <laughs> because I travel a lot. And so there's a, there's an element of a little bit of anxiety and, and, and things don't always work like clockwork, like you want them to. And so anyway, I, I, you know, even in my dream, I'm thinking, oh, this is a nightmare. This is one of those, the, those things. But I, I, I walked up to the reservation desk. and can you give the key to my room so I can quickly get my luggage? And there was a beautiful young lady standing next to me, a young lady. And she says, oh, Dr. Stone, good to see you. Do you recognize me? You might remember the story. And I said, you do look familiar. And she says, uh, yeah, my name is Joy. Uh, you've ministered for my father many times. And she says, I heard your dilemma. And if you are willing to travel with me with joy, then I can get you where you need to be on time. Stand to your feet. Father, for the joy set before us. Father, this doesn't have to be a wearying season. Father, you want us to travel with joy. You want us to get where we need to be because we've made a decision not to go, oh, everything's so hard, everything's so heavy, there's so much responsibility, I'm so busy. You know, when am I resting right now? Father, right now, I call joy my friend. I embrace joy and the strength that it brings in my life and the laughter and the pleasure and the delight that it brings in my life. I refuse to be a miserable Christian. And so, Father, we say, motivate us with your joy in Jesus' name.